This is David Perkins. David is a, a uh, teacher. What grade? Uh, high school. High school. Juniors and seniors mostly. I do history and government. History and government. And you are in the chess something down here on, on weekends? Yeah, I'm a coach of the club. chess team. But uh, actually, the people that play chess all around the city come right across the hallway there and uh, practice. I think everybody's welcome. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I'm not speaking for them, but I'm sure that uh, that's what they would want me to uh, Okay, so we have to say. share with our uh, campuses in California, too. Uh -huh. So okay. you're on air. I see. Good. Okay. Now, do you want to get this going? Yeah, How do you want to start? David uh, has uh, a lot of, I think, great information from the five minutes. I spent talking to him before what he's going to talk about. He has a, just a fantastic, fabulous background, a lot of history, a lot of experience around the world, and I'm going to turn it over to him. Okay. Well, we can do that, and then we can just sort of go back and forth between the. Okay. Uh, Let's see, I'll probably use the. Uh, you need a camera. Can I? Um, yeah, yeah, just erase that. I'll keep the word synergy on there because I like it. Actually, All right. It may come up a lot. I don't know how you guys discussed it, but I'd love to hear it. So maybe we can start on with that and uh, maybe. Everybody, just kind of tell me tell me your name and, and one thing, even though you don't know me, just based on what he said, what do you think that I might be able to to uh, talk about, other than the fact that I wrote a book, and now I'm a teacher, and now I play chess. So, can we start with you, sir? Um, I'm just curious what, what you guys were getting from this. You obviously were talking about it. We were talking about it earlier this morning, and... Um, it's kind of meaning that you have to have like a group. It was better than just one person. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, as a teacher, we're being taught that too. It's better rather than having a teacher up here going nah, 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 that you guys are all collaborating and working together. Very good. And yourself? Uh, my name is Mark. Um, Any synergy for me at least um, is basically saying that you know. If you work as a collaboration, you're going to get more work done. Uh -huh. You're going to get a more reliable answer from more points of view. Ah, oh, excellent. More points of view. They're very good. And yourself, sir? I'm uh, William from North Carolina. And I think it just means that uh, the more minds you have with the input, the better the results will be for the output. Mm -hmm. You know, good. I'm glad you used the word minds because that's something that they don't teach in school is the power of your mind. We'll get into that. Or remind me if I forget. And also the fact that all of them are unique. Everybody's mind is unique. And unfortunately, we're in an educational system that puts you in a box. Hey, you're five years old. You're going into kindergarten. Well, you know, five years old might be something else for somebody else and all that. Very good point. I'd love to expand on it. <laughs> But I want to roll through that, but that brings a, a point, and I, I will try to put it in the back of my mind so we can come back, because I would love to. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. um, pretty much basic, well, that's two hangs better than one. Okay, that's a, a good way. Sometimes when we have phrases like that, that are common, that helps us associate to remember that, because really, uh, a year from now or something, you might hear the word, and you go, yeah, it has something to do with uh, but when you have a phrase like that, it's called associative learning where you can tie it in with a phrase that you're familiar with and it, and it automatically brings you into what it is. Very good. Yes? Yeah, we're going to talk about the manner and basically I think that is like three of my mind before. Uh-huh. Okay. Like that. She's expounding on them. Very good. Yes? I'm hearing, uh, I think to be more productive and more passionate. Okay. Wow. Passionate. How? How? From your mind, when you saw that word, how did you come about and put passionate into it? Because you get all the help you need, and you get more energy, and you get more of yourself. Ah, very good energy, and that's an important one, too. In fact, uh, I'm just going to put some energy in the moment, okay? Because I believe in that, too. Yes? I'm Mark Houston from Madera, California, and I think it's just the energy you get from the input by more opinions, more minds working mm -hmm. together. When you guys are having a discussion, isn't it a little bit more exciting rather than when you read a book or when you have one person doing that? 
very good thing to go on. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Otis, and I'm originally from uh, Gary, Indiana. And um, what I think about uh, synergy uh, is uh, uh, in terms of a uh, collaborative effort, as you stated earlier, I, I've read the book. Uh, I have the book, um, um, Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. Uh -huh. And what the term that comes to mind when I see that word is the mastermind. Uh, the mastermind can you expand on. Yeah. I, I, I'm familiar with the book. Mm -hmm. I, I may ask him too, but I don't. But yeah, yeah. what's that concept? I can't, I can't remember uh, which number principle it is, but it's about. It's, a, it's definitely about synergy. It's about it, uh, um, bringing people together uh, in an uh, effort to uh, uh, obtain a goal or, or a direction or a final direction. Okay. A purpose. All right, so it's not only like everybody else seeing it as a collaboration, but you also see it being it as a vehicle to help somebody's goal. Let me expound on something on a why a goal is very, 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 very important. If you have a decision in front of you, and I'll let this pencil be the decision, and it's right there in front of you, and you don't know what your goal is, that decision can open up all kinds of discussions with you standing here. Wow, I got to do that. Well, if I go over here, oh, this is possible, this is possible, this is possible. If I go over here, this is possible, that's possible, that's possible. Wow, I don't know. There's, there's some on the left and there's some on the right. You don't know what to do. You could do that for two years. Subconsciously, you could be in that state for two years debating, should I stay or should I go? <laughs> no, 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 no. But, if you have a goal, you only ask one question. Which of these sides, which of these choices is going to give me my goal? This way. Great. Grab it and go. It's over. It's done in a second. So when you have a goal, a clear picture, we'll talk about that later too, a clear picture of what it is that you want to do, anytime you have an obstacle, anytime you have a decision that's coming in that you have to do, it's gone like that because you work at it at your goal other than I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, that's very good. Yes, sir. Jess from Sewage, California. Synergy means, uh, well, we've all heard of it. And that's okay. Even if you repeat, you're going to add one word, just like over here, that made a difference. Even you expounding on it. It gave us, it was the same premise, but instead of two people, you thought it at three, it gave us a different picture. That's what we're looking for. So don't worry about repeating what somebody else did. I mean, let's face it, it's one word. <laughs> we only got so many definitions, right? right? So that's okay. That's okay. Go ahead. Well, synopsis and synergy are similar. Is that you have to connect with people, you have to connect with each other to get to a common goal. Uh huh. Okay. And I like the fact that you used the word synopsis, which means to compact it, to get it to its essence. Don't tell me the whole book, give me the synopsis. I want to know the, the idea of the whole story right now, because we got to move quick. Very good. Are you part of us, too? Yes, I am. Why are you sitting way back there? You're in trouble. Please. My name is Jesse. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I like that city, by the way. <laughs> Enjoy going there. Go ahead. Good business. Um, you know, people say that about Vegas, too. So. I always believe that every place has a positive and negative side. Seriously. And you just got to focus on the good side. I'm sure we could say a lot of, you know, bad things about Vegas for those that live there. And, you know, there's the good things. But it's funny how the image of the city is totally different when you live there. Like, what happens when people, oh, you're in Vegas? I'm going to come visit you, right? And when they come here, where do they want to go? On the Strip. Nine times out of ten, most people say, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> On the Strip? You really want to go there? You know, here, go. Go on your own. You don't want to get to it. But, but go ahead. So um, you were talking about this. My definition of uh, synergy, uh, I found out firsthand, we had an assignment earlier, and instead of um, collaborating with my fellow classmates, I went out on my own and made several, several, several mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get angry about it. I mean, I actually learned something, and my instructor was right me that I was blessed to work with mm -hmm. this group. Because um, we saw the amount of problems, you get it done faster. I'm trying to figure out questions. Well, you know, you bring up an interesting point when working together because sometimes 
you know, the group, that's the formula. But sometimes when you work in a group, you know, you got people that slack in, I want to do it. And you go, you know, I'll just move a lot faster on my own. So there is that balance, you know, and it's interesting that you bring that up and stuff as well. Now, on the energy part, there's one thing, it's a picture, but it really, what? I'm sorry, go ahead and tell me. I forgot that. one, who? Oh! I'm invisible. No, I'm sorry, I went that way and I did. Go ahead. And your name is? Erica. Erica, I'm sorry for this one, but go ahead and tell me. I'm sorry? I'm not good anymore. What do you mean? Well, wait a minute. First of all, let me tell you something about good. All right. And what's the other word? Bad. We hear that. Ignore that. You know why? It doesn't exist. Let me ask you a question. Is water good or bad? Exactly. Hey, it's great if you've been out here in Vegas. I needed some work right now just walking over there from putting my coins in the little meter there so I can come in here without getting a ticket. Walking over here, wow, I'm thirsty. I need some water. It's really bad if you're in a submarine and it's sinking. It's going to kill you. Right. Right. So water, anything, a person. A book, a flower, anything that exists is not good or bad. It is. It exists. That's all that it is. It's the condition on how it's used. Have you heard that expression? Um, what was it? It's not the uh, um, life or something. It's not not what happens to you, but how you react to it. There's right. some right. there's some phrase by some famous writer. I, right. It slips my my mind right now. And that's kind of a way to approach it. It exists. You exist. You have something to say. When they first put that word up, let's go there before y'all started discussing it. What did, what did that mean to you, or what was your past experience with that word? So on the computer, it's synergy. It's sort of tied all the computers together. I was about to say that. That's why I choose invisible, so everybody's coming around and doing it. Go ahead. But I, uh, write it down so we don't forget it. Because I do want to go ahead. Oh, okay. You're talking about like a balance in nature to where one is helping the other even though that they're totally that they're totally different. Yeah, you're right. You have the big sharks. Have y'all seen those pictures? And you got the little ones that are kinda like either on it and they're just nipping at it or something that's on that to help clean it up. That's a beautiful description of it, really. Because we're all looking at it in the context and the terms, and this is one reason why it's so great to have different ideas and pictures on the same word. We're all looking at it in the context of what you experienced at it here in class. She went in the middle of the ocean. But it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same picture. But the fact that if you were in a group and you had a problem and it was this word and everybody was coming at it from a <clears throat> business point of view, because everybody here with their computers and they're sitting here acting like a business person, and she goes like, well, you know, over on the Antarctic Ocean, penguins, things like that, it'll give you a different perspective to go, wow, now that we see it in that way, that'll give you the solution. So thank you for that, really. All right, you, you, um, excuse me? Please read that. Right. This? Yep. Mutually beneficial relationship by building one another's strength, decreasing mistakes when another. Oh, see, you wrote the whole thing down already for that? Now, was this after I, I asked the question? No. No, that was your notes when you have the discussion. No, I was when you were talking about it. So I was like, I'm going to say this. Oh, okay. Mutual. Can I read this again? I was just reading it real fast just to read it. You know, to make, because I didn't know what it was. I was just reading it on there. Can I read it for everybody now? Mutually beneficial relationship, which means what? It's good, for both. good for both. Benefits both. By building on one another's strengths, like that. You know, hey, I'm, you know, what's that song? You've got the brains, I've got the bronze. Let's make lots of money. Remember that one from the yep. 80s? Yes, from the 80s. That's just, wait a minute. Yeah, I can get that at far. I may have all of you, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> um, okay, by building on one another's strength. Decreasing mistakes one might overlook to achieve 
Is it a, a goal, a valuable goal? Okay, beautiful. Can you all give her a hand on that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you did a little hand in that too? Uh, y'all are poets. Seriously, y'all are poets. Oh, no, no, I didn't, no, I don't take any credit. Well, wait a minute. Was the basis of the conversation assisted you in writing that? Oh, then let's, okay. not, let's not blow that off so quickly, <laughs> Odin. All right? Okay, well. I want to, if I could, share with you one thing that when I think of the word synergy, that really helped me in a lot of areas of life. And you know how when we just talked about having a picture, and this one picture sort of helps helps you sort of see things and stuff on that? I'd like to share with you this picture. And it's an actual thing. Anybody know what it is? Uh-huh. Yes. It's, it's a spiral. It is. But it'll... What, what's the spiral that I possibly could be thinking of? Wait, 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 wait. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. You said... It's the universe. Okay. Now, I, I like the fact that you said that. That's exactly kind of where I, I go in that. What was yours, just so we don't forget? Um, three of, the three elements of, uh, uh, of connection. Okay, okay. So let, let, me, let me go with this, because my mind's there, and if I do, I'll forget. I may not come back to it in three years later. <laughs> It's just the way my mind's working. It's like, oh, it's in, and then it's out, and then who knows when it comes back. This actually was thought of to be the universe in Einstein's time. When Einstein came up with all his formulas, and, you know, E equals MC squared and, and all that stuff. In fact, I'll write that down, and I'll tell you on that. That was his concept of the universe. However, we know now the universe is a little bit bigger than that because right now we call this our Milky Way galaxy. galaxy. Right, it's called the Milky Way from our perspective, but that's a galaxy. And by the way, we're right here. If you want to know where the planet Earth was, we're right there. Third rock, third rock from the sun. Yeah, well, and that's the sun, but I mean, that's what. But all the stars that we can see with our eyes only take up about this much. When you look at all the stars that you can see, that's about the amount of the galaxy that we're able to see. And if you're a Star Trek fan, this is the Alpha Quadrant. <laughs> Over here is the Data Quadrant. If you're a Star Trek fan, and you know, or you know where we're going with that, and that's kind of where they divided it up. Now, here's my point from this, because you know that well. There's all kind of other millions and millions of galaxies all right on here. You know more than Albert Einstein. You do. When he came up with all his theory of uh, relativity and all that other kind of stuff, this, in his mind, was the universe, because that was all the concept that they have of what the universe was. So when he made up all his formulas, this was all he was looking at. But thanks to a guy named Hubble, and I don't mean the telescope, because they named it after the guy, and it wasn't until later on that he got, he, without the Hubble telescope, this is what's amazing, that's why they made the Hubble telescope, to go like, let's do what Hubble was doing, was let's look at all these other galaxies way out here. Well, now that you have that, it totally changes. That was only like 20 years ago. It totally changes the whole perspective on how we see this word, the universe. It's not the universe anymore. It's the galaxy, and now it's even bigger, and this happens all the time. So before we go on, you are smarter than Albert Einstein. Seriously, you are. In this perspective, in this concept, he didn't understand that. In fact, Albert Einstein um, said that uh, this thing, as we know, is uh, expanding. Albert Einstein said that it couldn't. It was actually a Catholic priest 20 years after that that proved that this thing is spiraling out. And we all know that, too. It's all known. Yeah, it's a spiral and it's going out. Well, here's my original concept that I wanted to share with you that really helped me whenever there was a situation or whenever I had to deal with people and stuff like that, is that we know from science now that I, Albert Einstein didn't, is that this thing is spiraling out. Well, I always like to look at things in the opposite way, too. We know it's spiraling out. That's the way it is now. But being a science fiction fan, let's go back in time. <laughs> let's go back in time. What would happen? It would all start to what? Spiral in. And there comes one point in time 
when everything in this galaxy was one big piece of light, for lack of a better word to describe it, because they don't have a word for it. If you make up one and want to write a paper on it, hey, get your name on it. <laughs> you, no, seriously, there's not a name for that. There's not a name for that. But if you write a paper, that's what you all are, I understand are practicing, you know, I had to write a certain thing. Uh -huh. and nobody wants to talk about it, all right, it tells me why. <laughs> we'll talk about it later then. But if you were to go, and it's really easy to write, I, you know, I could I'd show you how to do it. You make references, well, Einstein said this and this and that. However, if this were to go back, basically it was going out, it was going back in, logically it should happen. There was a point in time when all this entire galaxy was in one big piece of light, and I'm going to call that Wawamagamala Lowimba. And then it would be that, because you know what? Nobody made up a word for it. So you could actually do that on anything. On anything that doesn't exist, if you write a paper on it and you give it a name, you did it. It's just like stars. When they find a star, what's that galaxy? Well, we'll call it MX23. You know, they used to name it after Greek gods, and they named it after the guy that did it. If they found a bunch of stars, then it would be their name plus X27 or whatever. But if you had a thing on that, but what is the property of this that, that I found so amazing is that if all this stuff is spreading out, and if we took Einstein's formula, which is E equals MC squared, which basically is this. If I had to simplify it, here's a piece of matter. If we accelerate it two times the speed of light, boom, then it becomes energy. It's energy. It's a moving around like light. It's energy when you grab it and make it stand still, then it becomes matter. That's, that's all that's saying. In, in a very, very simplistic form. So if you take that formula and plug it into here, that as these particles of light, these lights spread out, and all of a sudden it goes out and it suddenly stops, there's a piece of material. piece of material collects together, maybe an asteroid, maybe a planet, sticks all up there, then everything in here are just really pieces of light. That helped me solve a lot of problems. That helped me with my anger. That helped me with anything, because you know what? Whenever I saw anything, I don't see a person. I don't see a rock. I just see pieces of light, pieces of light that are standing still. In other words, it's what every religion and philosophy tries to say. We're all the same, but different. But in a way that it helped me really see it, to say, yeah, we are the same. You know, you get that in school. Well, oh, let's love one another, and you be, and you know, I don't feel that at all. You go over there, give me a bunch of trouble. But when I when I saw the, the the galaxy, or at least everything that I'm associated with in that context, it really helped me. So when that was brought up, I just wanted to share that with you guys. When the word uh, universe and galaxy came up, that that concept. Plus, I wanted to tell y'all that you were smarter than I. Was. I thought that I thought that was one a joke. I didn't say it, just try to be nice. It's true. Because you had that picture, you're smarter than Albert Einstein. All right, one thing, uh, if I can, since we're on synergy and energy and stuff like that, let's look at the brain. Let's look at how your brain works. Because there's a synergy going on between your brain in much the same way that uh, you talked about the fish, the sharks, and that working together. You know, your brain sort of works together like that. And I'm going to draw a little picture so it represents the two parts of the brain. This is your conscious mind. This is what you use mostly when you're awake, when you think. Okay? This is your subconscious mind. This is what does stuff without you thinking. Now some parts of you are muscle-based, like your heart. You don't have to think to beat your heart because your muscles do that yourself. But believe it or not, on your automatic system, your breathing does. Can you imagine if you had to breathe conscious? My lecture would be like this. Now, before we go, oh, I'm sorry, I got to breathe. Before we go on any further, I want to discuss. Oh, wait, I got to breathe again. But luckily, this part of your brain does that, and this thing is on automatic, and it's recording all the time. From the time that you were born, this thing is on, recording, recording when you're sleeping. When we're having a conversation here and somebody walks by, I go, hey, Lou, you'll be waiting for the bar over at 4 o'clock. You're going to know about that. You may not have been listening to it. It may not come up. But if somebody asks you two hours later, hey, where's Louie going? You're going to say they're going to go over to the bar and they're going to be there at 4 o'clock. 
you know how when you know something but you don't know how you know it? That's one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons that you do. Now, the properties of how these things work are very different, but important to know too. And one of them is, is that this thing fills up. That's why I made it to kind of look like a little flash drive. It fills up every day. And there comes to the point, and I'm sure that you've all experienced it when you like studying for a test. Man, I just can't do this. I'm just, I'm, I'm filled up. You are. The best thing to do is go to sleep, because you know what happens when you go to sleep? It, it, gets, it gets erased. It'll erase 80 to 90 percent of it, and you start fresh. That's your short-term cognitive memory processor. This part of your brain, however, remembers everything. So if you needed to study or you needed something or you had something you had to go on and you're at that point of being full, forget it. 11 to 12 o'clock at night, forget it. Wake up 30 minutes or an hour earlier. You're going to be a lot more effective as soon as you wake up to try to put stuff in here and stuff that you can use. Okay? That's, that's a way that that works. Now the other thing is, is how do you use this part of your subconscious brain? How can you use that? It's in there. But when we talk about synergy, let's look at the connection between this part of your brain and the other part. And actually, they send messages to each side all the time. This doesn't happen that much because you don't consciously think of it. This is your conscious mind. I'm going to the store. I'm hungry. I want Mexican food. That's conscious. This over here is just all abstract and stuff off. But actually, this part of your brain communicates with you all the time. Anybody knows what it's called? It's called a dream. When you dream, that's your subconscious giving it to you. Unfortunately, you don't understand them because here's why. It's been shown that before you fall asleep, you change your thoughts every six seconds. First you think about this, then you think about that, then you think about this, then you think about that, on and on and on, and then all of a sudden you fall asleep. Well, if I was to graph that out, this is what it looks like. Oh, my dog's sick. Oh, your boyfriend and girlfriend's angry with you. Yeah, your mom needs this. Yesterday your brother, and then you fall asleep. Well, these are not only different thoughts. They have different emotions. It's in different times. You're worried about something yesterday. You know, you, oh, today this happened. Oh, tomorrow I'm worried about this. So when your subconscious gets all those things, it tries to make sense of it, and then it gives you back as a crazy dream. That's why you wake up going, wow, I dreamt my mother was a snake chasing me with a vacuum cleaner, and I just don't understand. Well, that's why it's chaotic. So there is a way that you can understand and talk with that part of your brain. And that's this. You be the one that communicates with your subconscious. You tell your subconscious what it is that you want. I need to remember all this stuff for a testimony. I've got to be lickety split on this interview. Whatever it is that you want, you tell your subconscious the night before. Visualize it happening. Whatever result that you want, visualize it. And then you got the whole power. You ever hear this thing? You only use 10% of your brain? You know, over here? You ever, you ever hear that? Anybody ever tell you how to use the other 90%? No. Nope. We're doing that right now. This is how you use it. You tell it what to do. You visualize what it is that you want to happen. And then it will occur. Have anybody ever done that or heard of somebody that did that to go, I woke up at 6 o'clock without an alarm clock? Something like that. Actually, you've already done this process yourself. Let me give you an example, and then you can see how it is. How many of you, when you were a little kid, you were going to go visit your grandma, or you were going to go to Disneyland, you had to get up early in the morning to go there. You're all excited about going, but even though it was summer, and you know, you're a student, and you stayed up all night, you woke up five minutes before the alarm clock went up, excited and ready to go. How many had something like that happen in their life? Anything. All right. You've done this. You've actually done this. Let me tell you what happened as far as this process. You were sending thoughts really all night, probably end of the day, I'm going to Disneyland. And that's important. Well, your subconscious wants to go to Disneyland too. So you know what your subconscious is saying? You're going to Disneyland. You ain't going to sleep in and miss this plane. 
you ain't going to be in on a down. You're going. So what did it do? It woke you up. Not only did it wake you up before the alarm clock went off. By the way, the reason it does that is because it doesn't like hearing the alarm clock either. That's why it wakes you up a little bit before. But it woke you up feeling energized. How'd you feel this morning when you woke up? Uh, right? But how'd you feel when you woke up then? Wow, I know I'm not going to fall asleep. I'm a wide awake. I'm getting up right now. That was this. That was this part of your brain working for you. And that's how you can use that for anything that you want to do. Anything. Writing anything. You visualize it the night before, and it will start happening in your dreams that it will give you answers that normally you wouldn't have thought of. Because remember, this is like a big antenna. This is a huge antenna. This is a huge antenna that can pick up stuff around the world. And you may think, well, what are you talking about? Well, I'll tell you. There's a, you know, I'm studying dreams and everything. The first recorded dream of this happened in 332 BC. Lady had a dream in Greece. Dreamt her brother was getting killed in battle. By a spear, they had these big monsters, the other side had. They were fighting by a river. She described seven different points on this dream. She was, of course, terrified from it. What happened was then she went to the temple of Delphi, which is where you went to when you wanted to get your dreams interpreted. It was over there. That was where all the priestess were, you know, when you saw that in 300. All those priestesses bringing in all the volcano smoke and everything, getting all crazy. And they, they wrote it all down. Now, several months later, the messenger came from Alexander the Great's army. Guess what? That guy, who was her brother, died in battle. They were on the Indus River. There's your river. The other side had this big monster they never heard of or seen before. They were called elephants. Then, uh, you know, he did die with the spear, everything that she visualized. Now, that's coming on if you believe in that your subconscious can pick up things on that. There's a lot of documented case on that. But your subconscious can pick up things miles and miles and miles away, not just what's within you or whatever it is in the realm of your experience. Like I said, that's how you know certain things when you had no way of How could I know that? I just somehow knew that and everything on that. Now, in the same way that this will help you with anything that you want to do mentally, it can also help you with uh, your own physical strength. And for that, I'll need five volunteers, and I guess there's some room over there. Can we go over there to do that? <laughs> no, it can be anybody. It can be anybody. I need five people over here. to the audience here, how many think these four people can lift her up only using their fingers? Only using their fingers. Five, four, three, two, one. Nobody said no. Okay, we're all good with that. All right, so let's get over here. Let's give it a try. Get your fingers like this. One person there, one person there, one person there, one person there. Why don't you come on over here? Over here. No, no, you can come on over here. Come on over there. Yeah. yeah. Now, only using your fingers. Go ahead and try to just, just give her try to lift it up. Now, only using your fingers. Only, you know, okay, stop. All right. Wow, you guys were right. They can't lift her up. However, remember we're talking about the little box and the circle box? Mm -hmm. They only use square box. They only use the conscious mind. Because here's what happened. After I said, can you lift her up, that picture went away. It was gone. Everybody started thinking about something else. You were going to like, well, I hope I don't hurt you. You were going like, well, I can't give a good grip. I don't know what you're going to do. And then there, and then everybody was, it, it was chaotic thought. But let's try this. Let's have it so that everybody is thinking the same picture. And let's see what kind of difference that we can have on that. 
All right, here we go, you know, guys. You're welcome to this because I need everybody. I need everybody to think the thought. In other words. Can you just take 30 seconds on it? All right. All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you all to put your hands over your head like that. Just go ahead and put your hands all over there. This has nothing to do with the project. This is just for dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I want you to and really no really no that I'm not bad. Let me be okay. Let's let's all be uh, serious and stuff on there. Now close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to in your mind picture you lifting her straight up. When you lift her straight up, she's gonna be as light as a feather. When you lift her straight up, you are not only see it in your mind, but you're feeling what it's gonna feel like when you lift her straight up with no effort at all. Did you see it in your mind? Did you see it in your mind? Did you see it in your mind? Yeah. Did you see it in your mind? Okay, let's give it a try now. We all had the same thought for about 30 seconds. Okay, go ahead and put your fingers back in the same place. All right, here we go. Relax, relax. We're going to lift her up on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Lift! 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 All right, hold on. Oh, no. I need you to be stiff because they have to grab on there, okay? So just hold your arms here as stiff as you can and also hold your legs there. All right, here we go. One more time. Ready? All right, now close your eyes while you're doing it. Close your eyes while you're doing it. Think about her lifting. Everybody do it at the same time on the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Lift. 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 All the way up. You can go higher. Lift. I think We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. I wouldn't have believed you hadn't seen this. Ah, that's the key. That's the key. That's the key. Now, here's the question, folks. Here's the question. And really, this is what the whole point of this. Were they physically any stronger the first time they tried than when they lifted her up? No. They're the exact same people. What was the difference? They were together. No, no, they were all working together last time, but they didn't have the same picture. They visualize what they needed to do, and then your brain tells your body what to do. You can't just do it here. That's just the thought. That goes one in air and out the other. But when you place it here, and that's visualizing it, I'll say it again, visualizing it, you've got to see it. you got to feel it. Michael Jordan did that too. They said, wow, how do you make all these fantastic shots when, you know, what, 0.2 seconds left and you're over there 20 yards away and la da 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 He says, I see it going in the basket before I even shoot. That's what you're doing here and that's what you did here. No, wait, she had her hand up first. Um, okay, I see what you're saying about visualization, but how did that woman see the brother get killed? Well, that goes on the theory is that you have different levels of consciousness. First of all, like I said, you have the physical thing, like the, the muscles that, that beat your heart. That operates on a certain level. Your mind operates on a little bit faster level. Your muscles move at a certain rate. Your thoughts actually connect. Like if I want to get a drink of water, which I do right now, by the way, I would, I would send a thought. No, I, I got it here somewhere. I just don't know where I put it. <laughs> sure. I may have some left. Uh, well, anyway, a, a spark of electricity, basically, if I could put it simply, goes from my brain to my hand, and my hand reaches out and grabs something. And that, that rate goes at like one thirtieth of a, a second. That's how fast that is. Now, you have higher thoughts, too. I don't know if you want to get into it. Thank you. As far as the, like, you know, the energy field around you, all those hippies in California call it your aura and chakra and you know all those, all, all those kind of things. But th that would be the only explanation is that you have a radar. And because they were twins, their brain vibrations were sort of the same. This is why twins have a, a higher percentage, like 90%. When you look at anybody that has an experience of like that, well, I just thought about this person, the phone rang. It was them. The higher occurrences of that occur with twins. Just because, you know, genetically they're similar, the brain waves are more similar, and you know, all this other kind of stuff. But the, the reaching, you can. If there was some event, and you might have had a dream about it, something that went on in Norway, and you wake up in the newspaper and it happened, that's highly possible. But you have to believe that it can. If you had a dream about Norway and you go, wow, it's a crazy dream about Norway, and you ignore it, you wake up, and, which is important for you to remember your dream while we're on that. Let me give an example. Remember, I got to tell you about Singer Sewing Machine, okay? In case I forget, go ahead. Um, I sort of 
remember it's something, I think it's what, what we called it, deja vu. When we sent something and we said, wait, I've done this before. Mm -hmm. Being military and training and all that stuff. When you think, when you really, really have to know. Like, I've told a lot of people, I'm a Katrina survivor. And when you got nothing but blackness around you, uh -huh. and your mind's telling you, your brain's telling you, you're going to die, you're going to die, something else kicks in. And, and you overcome it. Well, you know, that's one good thing. There's three theories on deja vu. The one, remember we had the galaxy and it's spiraling out, and one thought is that as you go here in a prior lifetime, it's exactly the same as this, but only a little bit different, and then as you circle around again, you relive it. Or the other thing is, is that life is like a CD record where the past, present, future are all going on, it's just that they're separated by, you know, an energy field, and you sometimes slip into the past for a second. And then the other one is actually as you... As you oh, explain, yeah, and and the the other one is that to where you're actually right before that moment, and you jump forward to experience, jump back to go realize, oh, I shouldn't move so close to the ledge or, or whatever. So those are your three components and thing on there. Now, what was it? Oh, singer. Before I forget, why it's important and really helpful to help understand this part of your brain is is with the dreams. There's a guy. In fact, I think it still exists. Singer sewing machines, are they still around? Yes, they are. Singer was the guy that was making it, and here was his problem. He, you know, I'm going to make an electronic sewing machine or, you know, electric sewing machine, and it'll do all this great stuff. Well, the problem was when he had the machine, which worked perfectly, by the way, but when he had the needle, he did the needle like the way it was when people sew by hand. Where's the needle? At the top. At the top. Okay. And it didn't work and it messed up and everything. One night he had a dream. He dreamed because he was interested in African studies. He dreamed he was being chased by Zulu warriors. Chaka Zulu and, you know, all those guys. Well, anyway, the spears, and, of course, he was frightened and stuff, but there's your Zulu spear. The spear had a big hole in it. And he was being, you know, chased and he was sweating when he woke up and, Oh, my God, it was a frightening thing. I almost got killed. Well, that would be called a nightmare, except, believe it or not, the dream had the answer for him. Now, why do you think he had it as a nightmare? If you have a dream, what happens nine times out of ten when you wake up? You forget, you forget about it. Oh, I had this dream, and a milkman broke a glass in my front porch. And yeah, it's no big deal, so you just forget about it. But he woke up in a sweat. Oh, my God, Zulu War it was so vivid. It was this, it was that. That's actually, there's seven different types of dreams, by the way, and one of them is it'll give you nightmares so that you remember it. And then he didn't know what the heck it meant until he went into his workroom. And that's when it made sense. Oh, I need to put the hole in the tip of the needle. And then you know what? The sewing machine worked. That was based and stuff and everything on, on his having that dream. So oftentimes when you have a dream, it may maybe trying to tell you something, even though that it's a nightmare. Yep. That's true. What? That's true. I think I'm making this up. <laughs> He's a history teacher. Yeah, and I'm interested in the parts of history that are not just, uh, you know, well, Napoleon fought the Battle of uh, Leipzig in 1814 or, you know. I don't go history like that. I tell stories. When I teach history, I tell you why Napoleon was a great general. You heard he was a great general. You want to know why? It's, it's an interesting concept. I'll show you on the board. All right, you know that when armies march, they normally march on roads, right? Even in the time of Roman times, when you start having your big armies, you know, here's a road. And this is why you see diagrams like this on the battlefield. You got all these blocks because those are units. Yep. And when they're marching around, they're all in a row, and then when they're doing those drills that they still do today, about page left, right, those were barking out older so that when your army's marching on a road and the other army's marching on a road, that your army can then get off the road and go in here and line up, and then they can line up and you can shoot at each other, you know, because at that time they shot, <laughs> you know, ran their guns in there and shot again and did that kind of stuff. Well, that's it on a tactical level. And the fact that in order to win a battle, 
There's two things involved. One is terrain. That still flies today. Yes, yes sir. You got somebody up in a mountain, that's going to be a lot tougher than you fight them over there. So terrain. The other thing is what's called concentration of force. That is, as this Confederate general, Nathan, somebody said, how do you win? What's your secret to the set? Success. And he said, get there the fastest with the mostest. Get there the fastest with the mostest. And it kind of applies to what Napoleon stuff did. But here's what would happen. Let's say you've got army, uh, let's say, okay, you got the Austrian and Russians, and they're all here, and that, they're at a certain location. What made Napoleon great was that he would always move his armies, and he divided them into four squares like this. And they were always a day's ride from one. So whenever one side, and it could be any one of the four, they would all operate independently, but they would also operate as a unit. Let's say this unit came up there, and oh my God, so they would all start lining up, and they're the initial contact. Now these other things, depending on where Napoleon was, he could be here, or he could be in that one. Once he assessed the situation, then he would say, okay, we're here, they're there, Let's put this guy to come over here and go on the flank, and let's have that guy come over here, and you come up in reinforcement. Or it might be that all of them go over here and flank that side. And the thing that he added, all of our military people, mobility. He's the one that offered mobility in there, whereas before it was pretty much stagnant. You got your big army there, and they fought, and you just slugged it out on there. But he's the one that out... Maneuver. The next time that mobility occurred, as far as like a big paradigm shift, believe it or not, was with the uh, U.S. Mexican War. There was a thing, they, they had artillery to be mobility, and that was a United States invention to have artillery that would be moved around quickly. It wasn't like, I put your cannons on a hill and fire, fire, fire. No, we had this concept of where we're going to move the cannons around depending on how the battle's going to occur. So that was kind of the next big evolutionary step. And, of course, every, uh, every battle had that. But anyway, when you hear that Napoleon was a famous general, that's why. That was, the, that was the whole concept that he put in there and why he would just basically want every battle and stuff on there. So well, one thing, every um, battle, whether you have superior numbers or not, superior numbers mean nothing when it comes to the training of the soldiers. Yeah, the Marine. Absolutely. You can, out, you can have all the numbers in the world. But if you have a smaller force that's highly, that's more highly trained than the dominant force, they're going to lose every time. Well, you know what? Uh, there's a saying: uh, the greatest fighting force in the world is an uh, 18 year old marine is pissed off. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> I just what I heard. I mean, it makes sense. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, the further up the street. Uh, the point that was uh, made, um, we, we we learned about this a uh, 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 bit here in class um, called the, the organized minority, and uh, the concept of it all is uh, that you know we've often heard in life that uh, you know majority rules, but that's not always true when it comes to the organized minority because because of the same concept, uh -huh. the same thing. <laughs> Um, okay, well, we'll go if I can. I'll talk a little bit. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, history, how to apply to the book, and then how to write. Okay, let, let's go in that sequence, and I think that that would be... Uh, Good, because I, you know, I love history and how you live and breathe it, and I, I love to share it. I mean, I try to make it interesting about Napoleon. I try to do that with every every aspect. But I'm going to tell you the greatest value that I can before we even get to what you know what I wrote about or the things about writing and everything is how you can really use history, how you can use it. Most people they just think, and I get this a lot from my students in school. Well, I got to study about a bunch of dead people. You know. <laughs> well, you know, and I understand that attitude. Seriously, I do. Because most of the time, history is taught in the way that I first mentioned when I was talking about Napoleon. Oh, uh, well, when was the War of 1812? 
<laughs> you know, I mean that's fact. But but if you look at history in a different way, first of all, the word history means stories. His story, right, comes from the word Greeks meaning stories from the past. And if you tell things as stories, and this is what I try to do to my to my students. You know, that's what people watch when they watch soap operas. That's when you watch one. Like, I tell them, see the movie 300? Oh, yeah, cool. This guy got sliced up in a deal. Yeah. It's history. Now, it's dramatized a little bit. You know, like the big <laughs> ugly guy, that, you know, and you know, fighting all stuff. But, yeah, there was like, you know, 300 Spartans, and they held off like 250,000 Persian guys. That was true. And it was true that when they were like six years old, you went into the military and, you know, you had to steal your own food. They wouldn't feed them in the army camps. You had to go out and steal your food. You got caught, they beat you. Not because you were stealing. They knew you were stealing. You got beat because you got caught. Don't get caught. You know, and that trained them to be like the fiercest, you know, fighting force in the moment. But let me show you one thing about history, if I can, on how, first of all, how you can not only use it, but predict the future. Because you ever hear this thing, history repeats itself? Yes, sir. You want to give me an example of it? Don't say World War One or World War Two. They happen for different reasons. <laughs> oh, it's the same one. History repeating itself. You got an example? Depressions. Depression. Very good. Economic depressions have that. Now here's the thing: is it because of stupidity or is it plans? Uh, it could be planned, though. It could be planned. Well, I don't want to get in politics too much, but I will say this. In 1999, there's a guy named Alan Greenspan. I'm sure you all heard of him. Yes, sir. Somewhere. Yes, sir. You know what he was saying in 1999? APRs. Wow, what a good thing! It'll it'll free up people's money because if you got a veritable rate, depending on the market, if you're fixed at five and it goes down to three, and you can get a three, you've got four or five hundred extra dollars a month that you can spend. It's great. Everybody should do it. <laughs> Adjusted. Alan Greenspan said that in 1999. Now, what happened in uh, 2006? Adjustable yeah. rates started to go up yeah, due to markets, which some people say are manipulated. I don't want to go there. I don't want to end up in the bottle of an elevator shaft. <laughs> but you see what I mean? So, was it by accident? There's only two reasons stupidity, it was a bad thing, or it was engineered. Right. So, I don't want to go there. Research it yourself. Come up with your own mind. But I will say this about history on it operating. And I want to give you a perfect example. And this kind of leads into a thing on the book. Did you? I saw this from actually the main character of the book. Who's this guy? His name's Carl Ernst Kraft. He's like the astrologer in the 30s, big Nostradamus authority and everything like that. But he looked at history, I found, in a very interesting way when he started to match historical events to planetary happenings. But I'm going to do one with something I know everybody here knows about, and that's music. Music in America. Did you know that in 1920, a new form of music was created that even people in Europe said, ah, this is America's contribution to culture. It was what type of music? Jazz. 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 Big band. Yeah. Well, now, there's something that associated with jazz, and it kind of happened by accident, and that's a technology. Well, that's a style. Technology is what? Your instrument. What's the instrument associated with jazz? Electric. Uh, the saxophone. Thanks, saxophone. Three. We'll, get in, we'll get into the electric guitar in the next cycle. So you have these three elements. Actually, the saxophone, which was developed in 1880s, was not used in music. Because when we're talking about here in, you know, 1890, 1900s, think of the movie Titanic. You had all the classical music. So when you had an orchestra playing it, we're going to do Beethoven's Fifth on the, 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 the deal, and then we're going to go Tchaikovsky. There's no, there's, there's, Beethoven didn't write a part for a saxophone. You saxophone players, get out. We don't need you. There's no saxophone part in there. You're not employed. So what did they do? They made their own music, basically. That's the place they could play, was in this new style that's being offered. Now, first, it was not popular. If you look in the New York Times, you know, 1918, 1919, when it was first started coming out, they said, oh, they're not real musicians. They're not classically trained. We're not even going to touch But what happens was it starts to mix with other forms of music, 
And then in 1940, everybody's dancing to it. This is where you get the big band sound. Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller, Count Basie, all those guys dancing. Um, big band, all those kind of guys. And also, this is when it becomes commercial. You're not going to see um, blue, uh, what would be the elements of jazz in the early times in your radio commercials and stuff like that, but it is here. That's when it becomes commercialized. Well, then, as everything, the next generation and stuff that comes out, you've got a new generation. You've got a new type of music started in the 50s. Rock and roll. Rock and roll. And guess what? We also have a new technology associated with it. Also, electric guitar. guitar. Electric guitar, exactly. Now, actually, the first recording of electric guitar was actually made in 1948 on a country and western song. But, you know, some kids on there. But guess what? Um, the critics said the same thing. They're not real musicians. They're just a bunch of kids. They can't even read notes. But, you know, they just got up and played and stuff. And it starts to mix. Now, the important thing to note is the roots of it start here. It didn't really even have a name or anything even here until the 1924, 25. And right here, 19, I think it was 54. When was Rock Around the Clock? Mm -hmm. One, two, three, five, four, four o'clock, right? It was 54. Yeah. There was a click, DJ in Cleveland that was playing that and said, Hey, Cleveland, let's rock and roll. And then that's how they got the name, and then other people started to go on there. And then it starts to mix with other forms of music, and then now everybody's going to start dancing to it until dance music of the 70s? Disco. Disco. Exactly. There's dance. There's disco. All right, and then we have to come down here, and then we got another new thing, new generation, 1980s. I don't know what you called it here. Uh, metal and, and, and hip hop. Well, yeah, that's still, well, the hip hop is more in a direction on that. By the way, I, I think you had in the mid 70s, you had punk, which was actually a rebellion against rock becoming like this, because rock and roll became more about the hair and flipping it like this instead of really raw energy, and that's why punk and everything. But in the 80s, you have a new technology, which is the synthesizer. Uh, well, actually, the first synthesizer was made in 1898. There's a guy named by Tell Harmonian. And this is interesting, too, because this is kind of the first thoughts of the Internet. This guy's dream was to play it through the telephone lines so that people could hear it all over the country. I mean, that's, that's ahead of its time. But the thing was is that the way that he designed the synthesizer, you had to have a generator, which was about as big as this table. Should have brought my book. It has a picture of it. One generator. But he had a generator for each tone. Each frequency had a generator. So if he wanted to hit this tone, there was a generator, a huge generator that made that, and then he would blend them all in together. It took six train cars to move this thing around. Six train cars to move this thing around that he had on that. Now there was a guy in the '60s named Robert Moog. You know him? Yeah. I actually met him when he was at the University of North Carolina at Asheville, which is where he ended up teaching. He came up with a brilliant idea, and this is why a synthesizer was able to become small. He said, rather than having a generator make each frequency of sound, I'm going to make one generator. And he called it an oscillator that would make a whole wall of sound, and then I'm going to have a filter that would cut away the parts that you don't want. This is why on every synthesizer, not a playback keyboard, that's different. When it says piano and you press piano, it sounds like a piano. It says jazz saxophone, you press jazz saxophone, it's that. That's a playback keyboard. That's a chip that has a sound, and you connect with that sound. But a synthesizer where it has all the knobs and you see frequency modulation and all that other kind of stuff. Spit triggers. And right. When you see all that stuff, then you've got really technically a real synthesizer. And that filter device is kind of like a sculpture. Give me a big piece of block. There's your big piece of sound. And then you use your filter to cut away the parts of the sound that you don't want. That was t looking at it totally the opposite. High pass, low pass. Yeah. You know, that, that's another lesson I'd like to do in it when you're trying to solve a problem, go to the opposite side and look at it. It's very helpful sometimes. Yeah, that's, that's what Mo did, and that's how he was able to make a synthesizer so that you could actually travel around with one. 
even in the 1950s, they were like as big as this wall. Yeah. You had to do your telephone switchboards and stuff like that and everything. But anyway, in the 80s, you have your sense. You have the new wave or, you know, whatever it was called. You know, the, the, the 1980s synthesizer, Duran Duran and all those kind of things like that. So you have your uh, new wave type stuff. And then it starts to come up. By the way, the critics said the same thing about them. You're not real musicians. You're just pushing buttons. <laughs> but anyway, we start to have a dance thing. I was living in Europe when this dance space was going on. They called it Euro dance or techno or, you know. However, you know, listen, whether you like it or not, I'm not about that. I'm just showing you the history of how it happens. But do you see a pattern developing so that we could predict? Yep. Do you Not see that how good. this happens? Now I'm using, you know, a general synthesis, you know, thing to put it together, but you see that how we have a pattern of 20 years, 10, 20 years, 10, 20 years, 10, and also we actually have something to where we can make a prediction about the music here. This is a question mark. Oh, I don't know what the future of music is going to be. Guess what? You can actually figure it out. You can not only predict it in time, you can say when it's going to happen. You can describe the qualities of what's going on. And based on everything that we have here, what can we say? When is this going to be? 2010. 2010. Now, does that mean, wait a minute, it's 2014. Why well, I hadn't heard it? Because it's in garages right now. It's in there. You haven't heard it. You're not going to hear it until about here or this year, next year, around that. You'll even start hearing one or two songs that represent it. And guess what? It won't even, you might not hear it because it won't be popular. Everything here was not popular when it first came out. Like I said, they called it, and they called it junk music. They called that junk music, you know, trash. Same thing with the critics. You're not classically trained. You can't read notes. You're only pressing buttons. What are they going to say here? The same. Oh, the computer did that. Or actually, they have a device. Kind of looks like this. They're developing it at MIT. You put it in your ear. It picks up your brain waves and turns it into sound. Now, what would the critics say? You're not a real musician. You just thought of that. <laughs> you didn't play any instrument. Yeah, yeah, you just did that. But see, that's what technology does, and that's what the critics do. Because where are the critics? They're always there. Critics are always there. They're all, you know, they've been doing it in years and years, and they ain't afraid of something new. Do you know what so, they're going to call it yet? Have they figured a name for it yet? Beg your pardon? Um, you know, they haven't because nobody's really heard it to, to give it a name. Because I think, you know, it, rock and roll is the best example. You had the Ames Brothers in 1952. This was all before. They sort of, they had a song called Ragma. Ba -da 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 -da. Ragma. <laughs> I don't know anybody. I don't know Yeah. Well, um, you know, that's some elements of what can be considered rock and roll. It wasn't refined, but you didn't have a name for it because they were an anomaly. It's just like, well, there's, what's this weird stuff here? Well, these are, they're doing weird stuff too. And then when you get enough of it, then you start to call it, you know, and, and it even happened with the styles. These are trends, but with the styles, for example, in the, in the 50s and 60s, out of Detroit, you had the Motown sound. They all had that unique sound that, that you know the the Motown people were putting together, they packaged it. You had in L.A. You had what was this? The wall of the wall of sound. You know uh, the Beatles. You know made the European invasion. You had surf music. You had all these different styles. They're different anomalies, but they were all based on you know the electric guitar and the new technologies and stuff that were being developed on that. But let's go back to predictions. We can actually describe, if it's going to happen in 2010, we can actually describe some of the elements that are going to occur in a year. We're going to have a new instrument. And, I mean, you know, you can say the computer, because in the 80s the computer was only used to sequence that. In fact, I will show you a computer in, with me in 1986 with a Commodore 64 tied up to a bunch of synthesizers. Wow. I was studying wow. electronic music in 1974 at Elmhurst City College and working with a guy named Dr. Heaney. We had a move in a harp and all sorts of stuff. Uh -huh. Well, you need to write a book, a history book on that. That's important. And I think it's lost because I think it's important and when people look at electronic music, it's not just pushing a bunny. There's actual design elements that you could really incorporate. And I think that's what's missed, especially when they went from analog to digital. Yeah. 
you know, when you have an old, like an old Moog synthesizer, you had a button and you turned it and you heard exactly what happened by turning that knob. But with the newer ones, in order to save money, everything's compacted and it's digital. And like on a Yamaha DX7, you got to go, I want to do the oscillator number one, I want to put it down three degrees, and I want to move it over there. Then you hear it. You're not connected to it. So those older synthesizers are actually better and stuff on that. Okay, so we know that we're going to have a new instrument. What else can we say? We just well, talked well, about it. It's not, not going to like you. Yeah, it's not, probably not going to be very popular. Until here, and then finally, when is everybody going to start dancing to it? About ten years. Twenty years. Well, when we, we got a thing, nineteen forty to nineteen seventy. Oh, how many years? Two thousand thirty. Nineteen seventy to two thousand thirty years. So we can add thirty years on that. So then everybody, as far as commercial thing, it'll happen now. Now, whether you're a musician, whether you're a writer, promoter, or anything, and you draw up your historical graph. Do you see how not only does it give you a better understanding of the past, you know, every music professor at Harvard and LA, UCLA, they all know music history, but they don't see it like this. Because when you put things in a cycle and stuff like that, it allows you to see it. Plus, now you can make a prediction. Now, if you were a music band, what would you do? Hey, I want to sound like Vanilla Ice. No. No, that's no, dead. I want to, I want to, you you want to be a part of the future. Right. And let me tell you how quick this can happen. Over here in the 80s, in 1979, there was a guy named Gary Newman. He made the song Cars. Here in my car. Y'all heard that? Yeah. Okay, well, once again, whether you like it or not, that's not the point. The point is, he was in a punk band. But he saw the synthesizer and said, wow, there's something here. And in one year, he had the hit. One year. One He's like considered, oh, he had, he had some more, but two albums, I would say. But yeah, that's the, one, that's the one that you know. But see, here's the thing is, he caught on to the future. He caught on to what was going on. There. And he said, man, the synthesizer of the future, I'm going to jump on this. And I'm going to have a whole, Kraftwerk did this too. There's a German group, all synthesizer, one of the first ones. But um, Gary Newman basically took the energy of punk which he was into, his style of music, but he did it all with synthesizer. And, uh, you know, he had a couple, one or two songs and stuff that was popular. But see, that's how quickly that can happen, because when you get down here, people are wanting something new. You know, you have songs here, right about here, you know, Kill Disco, I'm Sick of It, and Let's Burn All the Disco Records. You know, when you get down in this part, you're always ready to revolt against that, which is really based on everything that was starting here. Because all this stuff is just a dance thing, and that, that, that whole thing, and it's always you. Who were all the bands in the 80s? They're all 19, 18, 20 years old. Same thing in the 50s. They're all kids. But that doesn't mean that it has to be kids here, because nobody at this age, the people that are older, don't understand what the new thing is. But there's one thing that you could put on there that a kid can't, and that's experience. Mm -hmm. I've been listening to music since jazz. I know what's good. And if you apply that with a new sound or something like that, then you can create it. Now, we're on the subject of music. That wasn't the point. I just wanted to show you how this system works. But let me tell you this. You can plug this into anything you want to do. I don't care if you're going into banking. I don't care if you're going into real estate. Clothes. Doesn't like, you know, black and white check that comes in like every 30 years ago. Find the cycle. Look at the history of whatever it is that you want to do. Find the cycle and stuff on how it works. What is the history of it? But not only what's the history, what, how does it seem to be cycling? How is it going up or down? And when you find it cycle, then you're going to be able to predict the future, and you're always going to be a jump ahead of everybody else. Because not only can you predict the time, but you're able to predict and make descriptions about it. You know, that, that'll be the case on that. New technology won't be popular. And you're seeing some remnants of it now. I mean, I could play them, but they're like eight-minute trance songs. And I don't <laughs> trance has been around since the 80s. Well, I know, but what I'm saying is it's, it's elements of that that are elements of what's going to be in the next thing. You're always going to have the vehicle. You know, so the same thing with rap. The same thing with rap. Rap came about. Bob Dylan was rapping here. Yes, if you want if you want to say what he was doing, well, I don't know, but I've been told through to Evan Lydon, though. 
I ask you how things can get much worse if the Ruffins happen to get up there first. Wow, yep. we'd be pretty that scary. Bob Dylan. Yep. Bob Dylan. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, he's talking that, and you can even go back further in the 20s with Scat, which is somebody that stuttered. There was a drummer in New Orleans. New Orleans? New Orleans? Um, and he basically, the singer was sick. He was the only one that could, knew the songs, but he stuttered. He sang the songs and he stuttered. He started a new style. They called it Scat. There was a techno remix of it. Scat Man. Hey, I'm the Scat Man. You ever hear that one? You haven't? Really? <laughs> you know, I know I sounded pretty foolish right then, so let me see if I can at least put it up. Show you I'm not crazy. Oh, he's not pulling it up. Well, y'all heard of cars. Everything I mentioned, you heard of. But let me, let me, let me, let me, let me do this. Oh, come on now. Cooperate. Q R S. It won't take a minute. I need to take a little break from talking anyway before I go in there. You know, we're all along the watchtower. I'm a scat man. <laughs> Let me give you about a minute. Of it. Well, listen to the text, and he's going to tell you sort of what it's about. That's a scat. Yeah. Somebody, somebody that sc stutters. <laughs> it's Scatman John, just Scatman. But basically, that's in the 20s. But he brought it back, I think, in the 90s. You know, that's his song, da, 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 because he stutters, and he wrote a lot of music for other people, and he wanted to do his own thing, and when he found out that by knowing history, lesson, 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 by learning history, he said, wow, there was a whole wave of people that stuttered that actually made songs, and they were hit. I'm going to do it, too, and that's why he says that. Scatman can do it, so can you, you know, so we all, so... Um, as far as history, now let me share something with you on how I found this. I'm a teacher, and it's not that I was going like, wow, I'm a teacher and I want to do some teacher type thing. No, it's not how I found this. I actually, when I was living in Germany, um, in the 80s, right about here, I had a guy that said, because uh, I was working with the you know, stars and astrology and all this kind of stuff, I, I don't want to get into whether you believe it or not. I should write a book saying what it is and what it isn't. When somebody says, oh, your moon's in Leo. You're going to have dinner with Raquel Welch on Thursday. That's what? crap. All right, that's garbage. But let me show you how I saw some stuff that was really interesting when I started to research this guy. But anyway, he, he asked me, he said, well, if you can make predictions of the future, can you tell me what the future of music's going to be? And I said, well, it's interesting. Let me look at it. And this is called mundane, where you look at cultural trends. And I looked at the history, and I noticed that, wow, every 30 years it does that. And then I applied it to a planet that takes 30 years to go around. Anybody know what it is? <laughs> I don't know. Saturn. Saturn takes 29.7 to make a revolution. I paired it up with this, and that's how I was able to get those descriptions. That's it. Now, how did I learn to do that? It's from this guy over here. And I'll tell you a little bit of story about this. Basically, um, the lecture kind of goes at the very beginning on how a cult got into the Nazi party and all like use it. Now, I'll talk a little bit about him. But he basically, just to put it in a nutshell, there's this planet that was discovered in 1930. That's the planet Pluto. And this guy, Carl Kraft, based on the movement that he was able to observe over five years, made what's called an ephemeris for Pluto, which means he's able to project it where it's going to be a couple of years in the future, 
and where it's going to be in the past. And one thing that he noticed that was very interesting. Um, yeah, because it's an ellipse, and sometimes it actually goes in closer where Neptune's the outer planet because it doesn't make yeah. a thing. It's actually shifted, plus it's tilted up a bunch of degrees. But he found something interesting, and he was looking at it this way, is that Pluto, there's a symbol for it, went into Cancer in August of 1914. And he said, wow, what happened in August 1914? World War I started. So then he projected it in the future, and he says, well, Leo is here, and Pluto's going to go into it in September of 1939. So when Hitler came to power in 1933, this guy, Karl Ernst Kraft, did Hitler's horoscope and matched his horoscope with what's going on here. And he made three predictions. Can't give my three fingers. Number one, he said, this guy's going to get us in the war. It'll start in September 1939. He did this in 1933. So he's a little bit better than Jean Dixon on that, because even when she made her prediction, it was just six months you know, out from being it. He also said that if Germany and England do not make peace by the summer of 1941, then the tide of the war is going to go against Germany. And then he made his last thing, which said that in 1945, uh, that's when the war is going to win. But he didn't say he was going to win. Of course, he was German, so even if he knew Germany was going to lose. He's not going to tell all the Nazis. The war's going to end in 1945, and you guys are going to lose. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. But all of these predictions occur true. By the way, in the 1930s, he was these guys. And the way that he looked at planets by learning that, that's the way I looked at Saturn and found the music cycle. But just to let you know as far as that's how he got some of these predictions. But if you'd like, do you all need to take a break or something to where you want to stretch your legs or something? You want to? Let's go ahead and take five minutes and let me get this thing to make sure that I, I know how to use the technology. And we'll take a break. And I'll tell you a little bit of background. And then uh, I'll just run through this real quick. And then I want to explore some writing stuff because I really want to help you guys on your paper and stuff that you have to do. I'd love to. I'd love to. Just whatever area that you want to. I remember my history teacher. She was really cool. Just come here. Are you right brain? What? Right brain. Right brain? Right brain. I've never looked at it. I've just always been this crazy. I just have fun. Then you must be right brain. Oh, okay. I'm glad you're having a good time. And you know what, really? What you wrote was beautiful. You know, really, I, I've been ex involved in writing. I wrote a book. I wrote a screenplay. Let me show you how to do it, too, because I think that, that you can. And I, I want you, if anything, that's that was quality stuff. You did it beautifully. But, but you did it in a way that was efficient and streamlined, not some wordy five-page thing that was out. You just, and that's, you know, you're going to be very successful. Thanks. Seriously, you're very, very good writer. Make sure to, to ask to come back. Yeah. I've seen like. How about you guys say that? Because if I do, it's just like, oh, yeah, okay. Wait, he's coming over. That's how I'm going to break. Yeah, I like it. Well, you, have, you look like you're having fun. I always, I, I love teaching. Get me up here and tell, tell me something to talk about. I'll, I'll go on with what I can. But we'll get into it. I'll just run through the book and then we'll we'll finish up with the writing and maybe we can start. A little writing project or something sure. like that. Okay, so three o'clock we have to start wrapping it up. Yeah. Okay. They leave depending upon like the Salvation Army has a bus come to pick their people up at three fifteen or three. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And everybody's gone by three thirty. Okay. I will. I'll be done by that. I'll just. I'll. I'll I won't even go through all of it because I just want to go through well, you're, whatever a few things. You're the expert. Okay. Well, the, no, I think we're we're on track.
talk a little bit about the book. If they're you know interested, hey, they can read it, and then uh, um, you know, I know I want to get them on the writing, and I'll, I'll leave the writing thing open. Good. That they can maybe I don't know how long do they have to do it? When's 16 it? Sixteen weeks. Ten weeks. Sixteen. Oh, this is sixteen weeks, and at the end of this, yeah, to graduate, they have to turn. They have to turn that paper in. Okay. Well, I will. You know, even um, <laughs> then, when I get a better picture of it, I'll, I'll, I'll give them some pointers on writing just real quick. Okay. So we'll have fun doing that. Can you back? Well, first of all, when did you start to ask? I mean, I'm just playing devil's advocate. When did you ask? Turned and walked away, and his eye contact was on to his next. That is, this thing was close. But you know what? Here's how I would do so, and here's how not to be invisible. What really brought my attention to you was when you did what? What you wrote. Oh. Maybe because you're a powerful person inside but your outer nature is very subdued, that sometimes has people frightened. You know what I mean? Like, ooh, here's somebody that's real quiet, not saying anything, but, but they've got a lot of energy. Nine times out of ten, most people are going to be frightened by that. Because they want to understand somebody as soon as they see them. Anybody does. To feel secure. Oh, that guy's a football player. Oh, there's a cheerleader. And... You know, because they're a cheerleader, you already have your decisions on how to handle them because you know cheerleaders, right? But when they see you, it's like, man, where's she coming from? If I say something, man, she might, she might expose. You know what I mean? That's that's why fear and stuff comes up. So the best thing to do is I, I would I would focus on the on the writing. Now, in a case on that, one way to do that is to write it out. Hey, can he come back and give him a note? See what I'm saying? You're People are going to pay more attention to the word, written word than they will talk. Because first of all, talk is cheap. If you spent the effort to write it down, that's why they want things in writing. Let me have the other contract. Right? But see, even on little little talk and things, that's why love letters are so powerful. If somebody said, "Oh, baby, baby," but if somebody wrote you something that was like you could see it was from the heart, it's going to make a bigger impression. Just by by writing. So even in something small like that. Get, get yourself a notepad on little situations like that. Write it a note. Hey, can I see you for a, for a moment when you have time? And just give it to him. Give it to him on one hour. Put it on his desk. So what's your name? Make sure I get it right. Oh, it's on the book. David, David Perkins. I'll write it down. Having fun? So you're using uh, it's a lot. Um, no. I, I you know, I, I have an interest in astrology from a historical thing. I don't use it like, oh, I love this girl. Let me do the chart and I find out about her. You know, you can't do that. But you know, you can parallel it with certain, you know, elements and stuff on it. Historically, I'm a historian, so I. I I look at it in a historical sense. You know? right. uh, make sure I know how to run through this. Okay, so we have one other thing we have to do at three o'clock. So does that give you enough time? Yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be through. I'll be done at three. Oh. Great. Wrap it up. Two minutes. Two. He died in nineteen forty-five, huh? Yeah, he did. He died two months before the war ended. Tragic, wow. tragic story. He shot himself in the head too. No, he died on a, a train going to Buchenwald concentration. He died on a train. He died on a train. This guy? Yeah. I'll, I'll briefly tell you about him because we're on the PowerPoint. We're not even going to be able to get to him. I'm going to stop this after 15 minutes, and then I'm going to spend the last 15 minutes just sharing some secrets about writing. 
that will help you guys on that. So we got everybody back. Can we all sit? Can we all sit so everybody can see this? Can everybody see it? Because I'm going to basically sit here. I'm, I'm sort of tied to it a little bit. I have to work the controls. All right. Uh, this this book. I never thought I would be a writer. I just, you know, hey, I thought I was a musician during the 80s and 90s. You know, I was playing music and doing that. Always loved history, but during the 80s, um, I met a guy while well, I was playing chess in the park in Germany, and it turned out, you know, like the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Indiana Jones. Yeah. Stay with oh, me. Yeah. We're, we're, we're almost done. Um, I met the German guy that was like running around the world. And you know, I know in the movie he's got a scar in his face and they're all nasty and everything. They were just scientists. They were archaeologists. And what they were assigned to do was to basically do two things. To collect a lot of these ancient writings because the ancient writings were describing technology technology of how the gods were coming from the heavens down to earth. There was actual thing uh, in Samaria called the Anunnaki, mm -hmm. people from the stars, and they came down. So they wanted, and it was actually, they were the first to translate all this kind of stuff, and they were actually translating this thing that actually described these vehicles. Uh, even in India, uh, they're called Vrishnana or something, something like this, that uh, they, they were the flying, and that's why their temples were, were built. The other thing is they went to northern India and in Tibet because by their religious beliefs that's where the quote unquote Aryan race originated. And I'm going to go a little bit into that as far as the theoretical stuff. But let me just basically tell you about the person. Because what I did is, uh, there's a movie called Dr. Zhigabo. I don't know if anybody's seen it. Yeah, basically it's sort of like this. I follow this guy through Germany and all the different places that he worked and did. You're 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 seeing his story with all the stuff that's going on with him, but on the outside you're able to see all the different departments that he worked with. Let me just briefly describe that real quickly. First, he was hired by Magda Goebbels to translate Nostradamus because he was the Nostradamus expert, and to, for propaganda, you know, to predict that the Nazis are going to win. His, his his name was very valuable and everything and stuff on that. Then, when uh, uh, there's a guy named Rudolf Hess who actually the, one of the predictions that I told you about, that if, if uh, Germany does not make peace with England by the summer of 1941, that the tide is going to go against Germany. That's why a guy named Rudolf Hess, the number three guy in the Nazi party, actually flew over to England. He landed in Scotland, but actually flew over there in order to make peace with England because he believed that prediction too, because he was an astrologer as well. Each higher up Nazi had their own thing, like Himmler was into the Ukraine. You know, different things, stuff like that. But that's part of history. Now, after that happened, uh, Hitler arrested all the astrologers, this guy included. So he was in prison. But they needed him because he was such a good astrologer that when Patton and Montgomery, who are two famous generals in North Africa, started to beat Rommel, they said, well, let's get him to see if we can find any weakness of him. Which is, you know, the Germans are very good at that. In fact, the Tuskegee Airmen, well, the guy, one of them that got shot down, uh, I think his name was Wilson or, or something. He said that when he got shot down, the Germans, you know, took him, took him on a four-hour drive over to his interrogation. And he said when he sat there and the German guy sat across from him, he said they had his whole life right in front of him. They knew what grades he had in high school. They knew where he went and did all the stuff in college. This is just some guy that got shot down. That's how thorough they were. So they wanted him to do the horoscope to find out, well, what would be Patton's... Uh, weakness is he too aggressive or something like that? So he did that, and then after you know Rommel got chased out, he worked at uh, Werner von Braun with the V2 stuff because they were starting to get the missiles, and he understood planetary motion, you know, trajectory and all the calculus and physics that needed for that. When he did that, he worked down in uh, southern Germany on the what is now the, the Czech border on this super secret project. This is called Die Glocken, which is kind of like the bell, which is this mysterious. Thing, just Google that, or I'll I'll send y'all an outline or something on that. And then after he felt filled his usefulness there, toward the end of the war, um, they actually shot all the people that worked there. They even shot 250 scientists that worked there. But he managed to get out early because he had tuberculosis, and he died on the train going to Buchenwald. And he died like two months before the war ended. So that's who I sort of centered the character about. And when I met the guy playing chess in the park. 
he told me about this guy because he worked with him. And I said, you know, I thought I knew his stream. I thought I knew anything about astrology. I never heard of this guy. I got to figure my dad. So I started to look up some stuff. And then when he passed on, I met some of his uh, colleagues. And when I heard their stories and all the other stuff, I said, whoa, this is make a good movie. So I started writing a book. And that's how I came about it. It's not like, you know, and it's so funny when I come to these book signings and stuff. You know, I wanted to be a writer all my life. And, you know, you hear all these stories. And I'm like, you know, okay. <laughs> to me, it just fell on my lap. But really, anybody here, seriously, everybody has a story to tell. Everybody has a story to tell. And I want to tell you why you have something that nobody else does. Remember I said in the very beginning, everybody's, everybody has a wonderful brain. Look how great it is. But also, it works in a different way, and that's what everybody could really need to see. I tell my students at school, I say, look, when you watch TV, you know, like, I don't know, there's two little rich kids on a boat or something. I said, is that funny? And they go, no. I said, but well, you guys are laughing your butts off at lunch. You guys are more real than what's on TV, and it's ironic because that's what TV wants. TV wants youth, and they want reality. Who knows it better than you guys? Seriously, who knows it better than you guys? So if you just took what you talked about at lunch, if you wrote it down in a script, you could do a treatment, which is only seven pages. Tell them what the concept of the show is, give them a couple of dialogue, give them some characters. You could buy that, sell that for $40,000. Hey, here's my idea for a TV show. It's kind of like this. They're doing that. Here's some dialogue. It's the way it sort of goes. And there's a character. They buy that on spec. Bingo. You can hang out in Hawaii for you. But I just want to let you know that's a possibility in writing. So don't approach writing as a negative thing. I don't want to write. No, that's your, that's your key to success. You can never express yourself better than what you can. That's why, you know, it's funny. I was, I was, we had a conversation about love life. I said, that, you know, uh, if somebody comes up and says, oh, baby, I love you. you show but isn't it more powerful when it's written in a note? You get a note, whoa, wow, I'm framing this. <laughs> Talk is cheap. <laughs> All right, well, let's go on to, let's go on to Hitler Scott. Like I said, this is based on Carl Craft. Now, what I do in this lecture, I kind of give the background of the whole ideological thing and how that happens. And basically, this is the history of the belief system that all these people are, are geared on. It actually starts in ancient Egypt. Now, there is Atlantis that goes on, but there was another... Uh, um, land that uh, Herodotus, who's in 450, it was Homer that talked about Atlantis. But this guy's talking about a land not over to the west, out in the Atlantic Ocean, but way up in the north, in the icy north. And he called the name uh, Hyper Hyperborea. Some of you may have heard that. They talk about it on the History Channel. Um, the next time that we start to get some identification of it is in the 1679, where he talks about the north, this island in the North Pole that splits. And it's called Thule and Ultimate Thule. And there's always this stuff about mysterious advanced race and all this kind of, kind of stuff like you get in Atlantis. Now, later on in the Irish myth, they talk about a, uh, one of the islands being High Brazil. Again, mysterious stuff on that. One of the things that comes from that, they actually made a movie about it. It's called Bridegroom or Bridegroom or something like that with Gene Kelly. <laughs> It's, it's about an island that only appears every seven years. Huh? You saw the movie? Okay, but, but the concept, and it's been done other ways, but the concept of that really originated here. This island, the legend of the island, and there's witness written account. I saw it, but as we try to go to it, it kept getting further away. But they saw the island, they saw the people, and all this other kind of stuff on it, but it would only appear every seven years. Wow, pretty freaky. But, what is, wait, we'll be going a little bit more here. So we have this thing called High Brazil. Occurs every seven years that you're able to see it. Let me jump to the future because I want to tell you about one thing. In the 80s, there's this thing in Rendlesham Forest, which was a military base. The Americans had. It was an RAA base. But anyway, there's a guy and there's a picture of where this thing, that's just an arms tradition. But there was two guys from the military that actually went out to investigate this because the base saw this thing flying around, landing in the forest. Jeep went out there to go do it. And one of the guys actually, while it was on the ground, went up there and touched it. And when he touched it, he said he got a series of zeros and ones and zeros and ones and all this other kind of stuff. There's a drawing from it, actually from his notebook. And of course, that's a little bit fixed up, but that's what he said the markings were on that. Now, in 1980, nobody knew what zeros and ones meant. 
Well, we do now, mm -hmm. but back then with C, you know, C Lab and C Code, you know, you were writing code that way. You weren't doing it digital. But in the year uh, 2000, he finally started to open up because that's when his like, you know, military thing said that he could start talking about it. He says, I have to know what these numbers mean. He went and got them translated, and this is what it says. Exploration of humanity, a bunch of numbers. And then you have a code here, 52.09, 13.13. What's that? Latitude and longitude. Latitude and longitude. Guess where it takes us? Right there. Where? Right there. Right here. Yeah, I see that. It's off Scotland. That is, in our previous map, Okay, that. Oh. And that's where before they didn't have coordinates. You know, they're on rowing ships. You know, they know too much as far as on that. But from ancient times, this area is thought of being a mystical, magical place. And then you get this as far as being one. So one of the concepts that the Nazis took as far as belief is this idea of the mystical land. And that's where we originated. But as even in the Bible and everything, you know, we've fallen from grace and you know, everything and stuff like that. Now, the other concept that they have is the idea of a hollow earth. And this actually started with Sir Edmund Haley, who's the guy that did Haley's Comet, came up with this idea. Uh, and this is why a lot of people really believed it, because he's a respectable guy. Wow, Haley, Sir Haley, Haley's Comet. But anyway, with this idea, you have Jules Verne, and Jules Verne's kind of like Tom Clancy. Tom Clancy takes the most modern technology, you know, wow, the super Russian submarine they got, and then he writes a story about it. And that's what Jules Verne did. That's why he was famous. He would take the most modern ideas, the top cutting edge of science, and he would write it into like a science fiction story. The other thing is later on in 1871, this guy is the one that really started it because he writes a book saying that he actually went down there. And he met a race of people there called who were human-like, called the uh, the Virilia. And the concept of real is an energy, a psychic kinetic energy. And the best way that you know, if I could describe it real simply, is basically is that you know the force <laughs> in Star Wars, the force is in everything. Those that can control it, you know, and they control it because they understand real. They understand the force. And you have the force in you, and if you're not using the force, I can use the force in you. That's kind of like the vampire thing. My will come, you know, uh, you know uh, interacting. So this is a very important uh, element as far as what the Nazi belief is. You're not going to hear that in the history books. This is kind of the toned down part, but that was a big part of their thing. There's a real society. Um, the other thing on there that we get some descriptions is that the French author actually writes some things and makes the connection between the European and the people that are living in India. Uh, is that, and it's this energy, of course, he verifies it, that it's linked with the subterranean people. Uh, it's the essence for what makes people superior. And it's the idea that these people eventually are going to come out and everything and, and on there. Um, the other thing is, is that there's this guy, and he's a famous philosopher, he's the one that brought perspectivism which is everybody has a different perspective, therefore nobody's right or wrong. That's Frederick Nietzsche. He starts to write on this. Now, there's one thing interesting about the Nazi party is that they're always looking for validity. I guess it's sort of an insecurity within themselves. But they wanted to say, oh, Nietzsche believes this because one of his uh, uh, books, The Will to Power, has to do with it, although he didn't mention real. And actually, he's identified with a lot of Nazi themes, not because he wrote with it. It was later discovered that here's what happened. He went crazy in the latter part of his life, his mother took care of him. When his mother died, his sister took care of him. And his sister's husband was actually what would be called in the 1880s like a, a Nazi or something. You know, nationalism, down with the Jews, they weren't called Nazis yet, but he was on that. He actually took a lot of Nietzsche's unfinished work and geared them so that it would appear to be uh, a Nazi stuff, so that's why they picked up on it. Okay, the other thing is we've got these crazy parts. A lost land of the past, the superior race. You have the idea of the hollow word. And then you have drill, which is the control of the energy. And there's a culmination in some of their literature that gets a combination of all. Notice the people in there. Superman giving the idea that you're the super race. There's a statue that sort of represents the, the Aryan people. 
you got Nietzsche there, you got Hitler there, and you got one of the uh, Vril ladies, which we'll get into. And then you have two societies coming in uh, at that time, the Thule Society and the Vril Society, and these are the major pe people that are part of that. He's actually the guy, the mentorship for Hitler. He's the one that mentored. In fact, when Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, that's the guy he dedicated the book to. You have this guy, Maria Orczyk. You're going to think I'm talking science fiction when I go into her. And then you have Elena Blast. Okay, this guy was a playwright. I'm just going to run through it real quick because I want to try to get as much as I don't want to get on the right. Um, he's also the one that influenced the Nazi salute. Remember we talked about earlier on how they merged India culture with being Aryan, and then we're going to mix that with the European. Well, you know, in India, and it's not just the swastika, you know, the swastika, you know, well, actually every culture has a swastika in some way, but they took it from the uh, Indian thing, as far as the way it was turned, to represent the power, as well as all the other documents that these guys were collecting. But the Nazi salute is based on bringing up drill. Have anybody ever been to any of these things in California where they go, Oh, wow, man, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to pull my kundalini spirit, my chakra centers. You know this one, right? Oh, well, okay. well, anyway, go just go look up chakra or karma. Basically, you sit there and you meditate, and you bring up the energy, which is called kundalini spirit. This is from India. And you bring it up through your different chakra centers to cleanse your centers on that. Well, the Nazi salute was based on working with that. You're clicking your heels. You're closing your foot chakra then you're bringing up kundalini spirit, or in their way, they called it drill spirit, and then you're giving it to Hitler. Imagine that going on thousands and thousands of time, every day, every person. See how high Hitler, give energy, giving this dark force, giving the real power and stuff to Hitler. Uh, I can go on, but I'm just going to get the basic point. This lady's totally wow, wow. She, this picture of her, which was drawn, in 1919, she looked the same in 1945, exactly the same. She's the one that started uh, the Nazi Gazelle Chap, which means the the uh, Association for Metaphysics. Um, she, in 1922, she met with Hess, Rudolf Hess, and that other guy Eckler, because she claimed that she was getting impressions from aliens, extraterrestrials. She actually, they took her to a retreat. She went into a trance. She started writing all this stuff down. It was in Sumerian language. It was in Sumerian language that she wrote down. And then when she got out of her trance, she said, I know where this stuff is, and I know what it means. And it was descriptions of what they were looking for, which was the technology. They actually went to where she said it was, and they dug it up, and it was there. The other thing that's really wild is that she said who they were talking to, which was on the planet Aldebaran, which is in the constellation of Taurus. And she correctly said it was 68 light years away, and they didn't find out until 1958 that it was 68 light years away. And she already said that in the 1920s. So when she's saying stuff like that, how could she know? How could she know? So, uh, and that's another one that's associated. She's actually a Russian lady, but she was very famous because she was into like different levels of consciousness and stuff. She came through. She traveled all over the world. She's very famous. She wrote a one interesting book. Um, uh, Glamour, a world problem, which I thought was really interesting, because back then glamour was a bad word. If you were involved with glamour, you're involved with like what movie stars' lives and all that. Wow, she warned against that—that that it was a world problem. That if people become too involved in those kind of things, it's superficial, it's glamour, it's not. Now we got magazines called that and stuff yeah. on there as well. It's interesting, but in other words, rather than worry about that, you should be worrying about your inner self. But she gave validity because she was in this crowd. So they associated her name and everything with that. Um, now, the reason they did that is to develop what was called wonder weapons. Now, there's a difference between the weapons, vengeance weapons, and wonder weapons. Vengeance weapons are the we weapons based on the technology that they were able to get that they built themselves, but based on the information that they got supposedly from a crash UFO in 1936. Um, as far as the propulsion and, and everything uh, on that, that's the V1, the V2, which you all know about, and the V3, which was called the America rocket. The wonder weapons are the ones that are actually using anti-gravity and stuff like that. And we'll get into that with the, uh, with the bell. See, this is the technology that this guy, supposedly he was the one that worked with when the crash UFO. You know how we have Roswell? There's one in Russia. There's one in Germany and all. 
the one in Germany was in 36, and they think maybe that it occurred because in 1936 was the first time that a broadcast signal was sent in the outer space. But you know what it was? Before that, they had TV, but it was done through a cable. But in 1936, Germany, to show how great Germany was in technology, they actually had the first TV cameras, and they were broadcasting the Olympics so that people in Munich and all over, all over Germany were able to watch the Olympics on TV, which was groundbreaking. You know, we're, we all watch TV. It's no big deal now, but that was a big thing. However, that was the first time images were projected into outer space. So if you were out there, you know, like if you watched Star Trek and the Vulcan saw warp drive going by, oh, those guys got warp drive. We better go over there, see what they're up to. We saw a warp signature over by Earth. You know, the movie, you know, yeah. Okay. Like that movie. So, uh, you know, if, if we did send a signal out, it makes sense that somebody would come there. So anyway, that, that kind of goes on. That's more the theoretical part. But anyway, those are his famous predictions. And then I go through all the other characters. This is the... Uh, thing that Magda Goebbels first had Kraft work on, which was, this is actual Nostradamus text. It says, during the course of 290 years, Britain would change its ruling dynasty seven times, which it did. It said, then Ares' war would come between Germany and another dramatic tribe, the Basque um, who would be protected by Britain. Wow, that that's, describes perfectly the situation in 1939. The only thing was, is that nobody really knew about the Barstin on. What is that? <coughs> well, Magda Goebbels knew, because actually she was into history, and she's actually not given all the credit on there. She was actually a general, and we could go on and on. But she knew that it was a tribe living east of the Elbe River, which is Poland. So now if we read this, in the course of 290 years, Britain's going to change its dynasty, then war will come between Germany and Poland, because that's what it was really talking about who will have an alliance with Britain. Wow, that, and it exactly says 290 years from that. And if you add 290 from when, when he wrote that, you get 1939. Yeah. Ooh. Hey, it's written. I'm not doing that. Well, enough of that. That's kind of what the book yeah. goes into. And that's the background. That's not the story. I just take it from World War II. But that gives you the background of the story. Like I said, I am going to donate this to the school here. Let everybody read it whoever wants to. And uh, it's a true story. Everything on it, I've tried to make it historical. Now, I did it as a drama because if you just put facts, nobody wants to read it. If you had the Da Vinci Code, if that was an academic book, nobody would read it. Well, if you, unless you're interested in Mary Maggie or unless you're a theologian, you might have read the book. But... If you have Tom Hanks being chased by two priests with AK-47s, hey, I gotta watch this. <laughs> I gotta watch this. That's what I wanted to do, but and I will get to you. But let me just tell you one thing on how I tried to keep it as accurate as possible. In that, I told you about when Hess flew to Scotland. There was a meeting afterwards, and I knew that uh, from the documents, Hitler was there, Goebbels was there, Goering was there, who's the air minister. And they called Himmler. The result of the meeting was that they were going to arrest all the astrologers in Germany. Those are the facts. Now, when I write about it in the book, I have the meeting. I have them talking. I don't know what was said, but I know what Hitler was like when he was pissed off. I know how Goebbels and Goering acted when Hitler was mad. And I can just imagine what the dialogue, and I know what the result was. They called up Himmler and said, arrest all the astrologers. So I tried to keep it as accurate as possible based on the facts. Now, if I have documentation of what was actually said, then that's in there. But that's basically how I wrote it, and it's no big skill. I just took facts of history and twisted it into a story. And by the way, let's get to writing. That's something that you can do. But let me tell you right now, and I'll tell you what, I'll write some paper or something we can give them later to help. I want to tell you the biggest problem that most people have when trying to write. We call it shooting their watch in the first sentence. I know that may be taken in another way, in another area of life. But that's the way the writer said it. I have nothing to do with the pointing out facts. But let me, no, let me describe it. Let me describe it. What's your writing prompt that you have to write about? What is it? Okay, most people do this. My adversity was actually somebody else. overcoming smoke. Bingo. I'm done. You want to put it in one sentence. No, that's got to come at the end. In order to write 
so that it's entertaining, you have to keep the people guessing. You have to keep the people guessing. Don't tell them that. Talk about adversity. There are many forms of adversity. Some people may do this, some people may do that. When we come around adversity to the individual, it can be applied in many ways. One thing that really is adversity to a lot of people is the indoctrination that they get from TV. It's hard to overcome when you see this, 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 and this. And then when I watch this, this, and this, it made me into this. Therefore, last sentence, my biggest adversity was overcoming the programming that I got from TV. Do you, do you, that's the biggest thing. You start with the most general thing, and then you put it down on there. Don't put it in the first sentence. You already just told them about that. They don't even want to read. Oh, I know now. There's no reason to read. I know what's, I know what the deal is. But if you go in this long, you don't have to go long. I mean, I know you got 3,000 3, words or something like that, which really isn't that much. How many words in your book? Um, hundred thousand. I'd say around hundred thousand. And the original manuscript had three hundred thousand, but you know what they said? It won't sell. Nobody wants to buy war and peace. I said, but there's so much. I got to tell you all this stuff. No, nobody wants to. Your your average your most thing that that that'll be a book like that because otherwise it'd be three times as big. But for a story and something like that to go, you have to get down to hundred. Which okay, I did. I weeded it down, which is okay because you know, when it's a movie. We got secrets. You know, it's the way I look at it. But um, it, it, this is the the thing that most people have trouble to do. The other thing that I would advise to do is, if you're writing on a computer, use that thesaurus. Find another word to do it. Don't say, what is it? God, what was somebody was talking about it? Uh, uh good. Don't say very good. Say scrumptious. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Don't say something like that. You use a common word and just put very. And the thing was to eliminate very. Because if you got something that was really exciting or very good, you need another word. You need another word. So when you find yourself doing that, and look at, look at, look at all the different words and stuff that you're using. Like if you're repeating them, then you need to use another word. That's what I would recommend and stuff on doing the writing. Um, the other thing is, it's a draft, it's a rewrite. I can't tell you, you know, I finished my, I finished this book in the year 2000, is when I actually finished, I actually finished it and copyrighted it. I look at it right now, it's crap. It's crap. It's, it's long-winded, it's, you know, oh my God, I'm ashamed really. <laughs> Seriously, to do that. But when you have something inside, you have to get it out. And once you get it out, then you tweak it. That's the writing process. You probably heard that in seventh grade. Write a rough draft. Go over it in again. I know it sounds boring. I know it sounds on that, but God, it's true. Really, it is. When you when you first writing it out, it's like you know you're taking it from the most raw source. And you've got to refine it and everything on that. It's kind of like cooking. You don't just throw it all throw it all in there. Okay, you got your soup, but you know, mix mix some spices, do some stuff, or whatever you do to prepare, like pierogies, <laughs> which is a long involved process. That's why they're expensive, by the way. The long involved process. You don't just get some dough and slap some cabbage in there and fold it over and put it in there. <laughs> That's crap. But when you got it like that to where, you know, it's really refined and delicate and it's paper thin and well anyway. All right, I'm 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 a uh, Valentine, I'll tell you what, I'll take just a couple of questions. Yes. How long did you take your rights from the book? Write the book? Um um I could say twenty eight years because uh, all the research and everything that I did, but to actually write the book was probably about three years. But I want to tell you something that's easy to write. Maybe we'll save this for next time. Screenplay was right either. I wrote the movie for this too. I'm trying to get it out. I'm entering into contests and getting on there. I'm um, actually got some good reviews. If you want to see all this stuff, go to my website. It's just hitlerastrologer.com. www. the word Hitler, the word astrologer. dot com. I know the title's Hitler's Astrologer, but on the website you can't have an apostrophe. Yes. Yes. Um, are you familiar with any? Works 
what are they talking about? Because sometimes I'll read and I don't know who wrote it. Well, Bill Schneider was talking about the something like that underground. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Underground military base. Like same kind of story. Lazar works with anti gravity devices. Okay. And David Ike writes about stuff on that. Oh, okay. I think Ike is, is uh, yeah, he's, okay. He's yeah, and um, a lot of people are against him because he's exposing a lot of stuff on there. Yeah, actually, Admiral Byrd supposedly found an opening and he actually flew his. Not that he flew his plane, but he was flying, and they pulled him in supposedly on that. And there's supposed to be now. This is all stuff. In fact, write this down. It's uh, Operation High Jump, where the, our military went to the South Pole, and uh, there was like supposedly a UFO base there. That that the thing that I was telling you about, this guy was working on. They moved it all out and moved it down to Argentina and then and to Africa and there. But really, writing a screenplay was easy. Because there's only two things you're doing. Number one, what do you see and what do you hear? What's the dialogue and what you see? And that was actually easier than writing a book. And it only took me two months to write 100 pages. Yes? You know how you use the, the amortization of life? If, if you knew you were going to Disney night, it would be easier to wake up. Yeah. Do you think it would be easier to wake up if you knew somebody was bringing your pizza? Man, <laughs> <laughs> um, pizza. Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 programming and stuff on there. All right, well, let me close up, guys. I really had a fun time. You guys are a great group. I hope that I helped on there. Thank you. Now, um, our tradition here is to. This is a book that we use in class. Mm -hmm. It's for memorization. So you probably I have no doubt that you know all of these. No, but um, I never pretended. Oh, and everybody signed it. Yeah. Oh, signed it. thank you. Really, I'm going to cherish this. So. We start with three little pigs, this little pig, and this week we're doing page 90. William, William Shakespeare. The yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. And so at 1 o'clock every day uh, on Fridays at 1, everybody writes down what they've memorized. Mm -hmm. And then at 1.30 we do a Google Hangout on air live and everybody gets to recite it. Oh. So thank you for coming in. Well, hey, thanks for this having me. For I really appreciate it. And now we're going to go outside and get a picture taken. Okay. Okay. I was just right. My class, right? Oh. Not in all of them. It's at my school library. I, I have to do that myself. Really? I go to the library and say, hey, you want to get it? <laughs> and they decide really. How could they say no? Well, believe it or not. So we want you to sign this to I sign it. I didn't Okay. I'll tell you what. I'll find it. Thank you. Whenever I feel depressed, I'll see the difference. Acceptance.
Thanks for inviting me back. Thank you. Hey, everybody, can you have your attention, please? Rob has something he's got to do. Very important. Take a note. No. Super. Take notes. 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 There's only yeah, I got <laughs> All right, we're going to have a quick special.